Hello, everyone. Welcome to the virtual artist talk for the Flow Journey Through the Mississippi River Watershed, an exhibition at the Dubuque Museum of Art, January 18th through May 17th of 2020. Thank you for joining us today for our first ever virtual artist talk. This is really a landmark day that we not only couldn't have imagined happening a year ago, but which we still couldn't have imagined doing less than two short months ago and look at where we are now. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe during these challenging and isolating times. Staying connected to our museum family has been more difficult lately, so we're so happy to have each of you join us for some much needed art talk together. I'll kick off the talk with an overview of the exhibition and then we'll hear from each of our artists who you can see here. We will have time for questions at the end. Please feel welcome to submit your questions in the question menu. I am so happy to welcome and be joined by the artists of the exhibition. These artists have been extremely gracious and patient through these uncertain times. Joining us are Anna Metcalf of Minneapolis, Minnesota, Libby Reuter of the St. Louis, Missouri area, and Susan Knight of Omaha, Nebraska. Unable to join us are Joshua Rowan, the photographer who collaborates with Libby, and Jennifer Lynn Bates of Cedar Falls, Iowa. So we'll miss them, but they are here in spirit tonight. I am also joined by my colleague Kay Schrader, who is assisting with behind the scenes management. So we're very glad to have her here too. My name is Stacy Peterson. I'm the curator and registrar at the Dubuque Museum of Art, and I am your host for this talk. I'd like to begin with some important thank yous. The exhibition would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, Midwest One Bank and Sustainable Dubuque. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the curatorial vision of our past director, David Schmitz. His ideas and research made this exhibition a reality. Flow Journey Through the Mississippi River Watershed evolved from an exhibition that David and I learned about from Libby and Joshua. Their traveling exhibition, Watershed Cairns, sparked the idea for Flow. Dubuque is a river town and the Mississippi River is an important part of our life and our culture. To best explore that, we brought together this group of artists from around the Upper Mississippi River watershed who are each exploring how we are connected to the river in unique but related ways. The overarching themes in the exhibition are movement and connection. Movement is how water moves and is moved by the land. Movement creates connection. And connection can be physical and emotional connection to water. Flow is movement. It's the journey that creates connections. Connections are physical, as in the connection between, say, upstream and downstream, but also emotional or personal, as in our experiences and stories with water. We see in this exhibition connections on an aggregate level through community, whether it's urban or rural, and on an individual level. A sub-theme in this exhibition is consequence. Consequence is related to connection. It is the consequence of our physical use of water, whether good or bad, that will result in how clean and fresh and abundant our water is. It is also the consequence of our personal experiences or memories of water, good or bad, that will result in how we feel about water. Many times when we think of water, we think practical, drinking, swimming, and we think less in consideration of our memories, you know, like our childhood memories or how water makes us feel, doesn't make us feel anxious or calm or rejuvenated. And those themes are also covered in this exhibition. The artists in this exhibition represent the watershed at different vantage points. So Anna's installation is the natural beginning of our journey as she shows us a perfect overview of the entire Mississippi River watershed and its major tributaries. 
She does this on a very intimate level, though, through social engagement and personal stories of connection to water. Libby and Joshua bring the focus in a little tighter and show us the upper Mississippi River watershed, its fragility and power and how it can change and be changed. Jennifer brings the view of the river in even tighter to our community and shows how what happens here is affected by what happens upstream and affects what happens downstream. Susan gives us an intimate view of the movement of water, but this intimate intimacy is, is somewhat misleading because it really opens up our journey and leaves us to contemplate about what about water uh, on a global scale. Her works explore the flow of water on the surface of the watershed and then how water is channeled below the surface. She shows us a glimpse of the edge of the super highway system of water that flows beneath the earth, groundwater, <clears throat> the unseen flow of water in the vastness of the earth below our feet. Now I will turn it over to Anna Metcalf to talk about her project upstream. In this installation, like I said, it shows the entire Mississippi River watershed. Anna uses over 80 ceramic cups to designate the main tributaries of the watershed. The cups are decorated with water stories. And hopefully we will begin with her video that describes the upstream project. The video is actually part of the exhibition and it runs just under six minutes. I think that a cup is one of the most intimate objects that I make. When people drink out of a cup, their hands cradle it and their lips touch its rim. It brings them nourishment. As a maker, cups tie me to thousands of years of other potters who made cups for their communities. And now cups connect me to my community. Our positive stories are always embedded with heartbreak. They became part of the river. It can give you life and take it away. Mekong and memories of those lost forever. Love your Wakpa Wash Day. We call it the Good River. You know, I am Mikoju Lakota. I'm also English. I'm a citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. The damming occurred and there was a forced relocation. The community had to be broken up and it had to be moved because of this damming. And the people were the last to know. And I think about, you know, my people. Water is very important and sacred to us and water has also devastated us. As a kid, you walk up and it is just, the river is, looks like chocolate milk. As I grew up and, and older and especially more as I was doing a lot of my research on my community, realizing that the reason that the river was, the reason that the river did look like chocolate milk was because of all of the silt and that it didn't look like that before the, um, before the damming had occurred. I am a Lakota woman. I grew up swimming in Wakpawashte, Good River, also known as Cheyenne River. It was like swimming in chocolate milk. My story about water is one about learning and wisdom and story. From the upper stretches of rivers, the upper stretches of dreams, to learn to listen, to carry forward truthful ways to strengthen my relationships with places and all the living things I that I share those places There's with. There's this place that we go to, that me and my family go to, it's called Island Peace, Islands of Peace, or something like that. Yep. And there's this tree like at the shore. You climb across it, and then like it's really scary because you're like in the middle of the river. Catching cans was, it was about easier. the Catching. table wide. <laughs> so see if I could jump across so the middle. So we took our beach, beach towels and attached our beach towels to our <laughs> canoe paddles, <laughs> and we sailed north. I decided that I would try and make a raft out of like a bunch of sticks. What in the world is a submarine base? <laughs> Doing there was a moment in there where I realized I need to follow I water. I lined up sticks across it, and it could float, but nobody could go on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I designed the cups to be simple in order to make it easy for them to tell a story. This process allows me to collaborate with people directly. They are made out of porcelain that I cast using plaster molds. The stories that I collect from participants are put directly onto the cups through a transfer process. I scan each story, create a screen, and then print it onto a thin tissue paper. Then I press the print into wet clay. After that, the cup is glazed and fired. Their handwriting becomes a part of the experience of reading their story, which is then passed to another person someplace else. My tricycle makes it possible for me to travel with tea into parks and river spaces. This project is traveling from community to community along the Mississippi River and also will be visiting other watersheds around the country. My hope is that through sharing stories about our rivers and lakes that we can find a common language as we make decisions about the future of our water and our earth. Here comes this tree that was about 140 feet long, and it was head right at the dock. And it was like, there was no way that I was gonna steer this thing out of the way. I was on the dock, sitting on the picnic table, <laughs> with, and it knocked, all the, all the boats stayed with the dock, and, and the tree and me. Farting noises? <laughs> and she's like, every time I come with you guys, I always end up getting dirty or wet or stuff like that. I'm like, I didn't push you into the river. So, hope oh, super fell like, Yeah, he fell into mud and he lost his shoes in it. He just... wasn't quick so. Yeah. Yeah. But he did get pretty deep into it. I believe that we're all connected to each other, to our past and to our future through water. Because I live in Minneapolis, I get to experience the Mississippi River every day when I bike along it or across it. And I want all people to be able to gather by the river or to enjoy their local water. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for what a, a wonderful uh, introduction, Stacy, and for all of the technical work too behind the scenes, um, everyone. And welcome to all of the participants. It's really, this is the first um, online artist talk I've ever done. So <laughs> thank you for, um, thank you for participating in the way that you are. Um, I'm just going to really quickly um, kind of capture a few things that the um, the video didn't capture and, and tell you um, maybe just a little bit of background about this piece. Um, when I um, was first, when I first moved to Minneapolis, um, I was a sort of enchanted by the river and by the fact that I was now given accessibility to this um, this really historic waterway on a daily basis. Um, I crossed it every day on my bicycle, and um, but I it was a river that I was familiar with because my grandfather um, grew up along the Mississippi River, but in La Crosse, Wisconsin, so actually quite close to Dubuque, um, and uh, we would visit him as a family um, most summers. Um, I remember seeing. Um, the Mississippi River and my grandfather, and um, and he just loved the river in a way um, that was so inspiring to me. Um, and I realized when I moved to Minneapolis that um, I was really interested in the river, but I knew the river kind of like a person knows a celebrity or a movie star. Um, <laughs> but my grandfather knew it as though it were a friend. And so I had this uh, endeavor um, from sort of the minute that I um, got acquainted with the river to understand it a little bit more deeply and from that perspective of um, friendship um, and um, and partnership too. 
Um, and so I, I, there, I've done quite a few projects um, about the Mississippi River and about water um, in general. And over the years, it's become really clear to me that I understand it um, just simply by being there and with it, but also through the perspective of other people, um, through their memories, through their stories, um, through their fears and through their joys, all of all of the parts of our experiences of water um, give it that uh, flavor, um, that personal relationship um, that that I really was craving. Um, and so that is how Upstream really started was um, my uh, desire to learn from other people about how their experiences along the river and um, and so I devised this strategy to um, be able to listen to participate in storytelling about the Mississippi River but then also um, I really wanted to create a way for those stories to be shared with other people in the watershed not just me um, and so I created this kind of cascading score story effect <laughs> um, so each cup carries a story that someone um, who participated in the project uh, told usually in um, a, a circle a tea circle actually we um, I do this through um, tea conversations or tea ceremonies and um, and then I also asked them to capture their story in writing um, so some of the clips from the video you saw people writing um, that writing then is transferred onto the cups and then those new cups with the new stories are given to more people in more places in the watershed um, and so therefore we we have a living river um, in in this way and a, a storied river I think is another way of saying it um, um, so this is a little bit closer up of the cups um, and I, I want to just um, also give a great um, thank you to the um, to the museum for inviting me to come earlier this fall. Um, and I came with a, um, a, a box of um, tea and my teapot and um, a, another box of cups. And we set up um, a tea ceremony in the museum um, and invited the local um, museum participants to come and have tea. And, um, and so all of the stories on the wall here um, are actually stories that were gathered from that tea conversation. Um, so they are really um, about the waters in Dubuque, and um, and therefore when they um, when they're interpreted in red and understood by um, people who see this in Dubuque, um, it is of the same watershed. Um, so it's a, a sort of a reciprocating story of, of people who might be strangers, but who share this really intimate connection with each other. And that is the water that they're drinking and contributing to um, in their watershed. Um, and I find that um, the sort of um, microcosm of those relationships in 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 the Mississippi River, which is a huge, it's you know it covers two thirds of North America, um, but but that here in this one space, um, water is shared to the degree that people share molecules with each other, um, and they become I think um, their 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 bodies become like one another, and that is a really beautiful. Um, a beautiful way of sharing a life with perhaps strangers or people, of course, who are um, neighbors and friends too. Um, and so here you can see the implements <laughs> of this uh, very living project. It's not um, a project that um, stays static for very long. Um, in fact, it has um, it has visited other watersheds. It's gone to Florida um, and uh, to uh, Oregon, actually. And um, I'm I'm continually looking for opportunities for water uh, for upstream um, to visit other um, communities, but. Uh, Dubuque has always been um, in my in my mind um, 
the the next place that I really wanted upstream to visit because um, it is it essentially is traveling downstream. So it's it's um, uh, started sort of in the Upper Mississippi right here in Minneapolis, and and then it is also traveling down to Dubuque, and eventually I would love for it to go all the way down <laughs> to the Delta. That's my that is my dream um, for this to um, gather gather stories and gather might as it travels downstream. Um, but you might be wondering why it's called upstream. Uh, and the reason that I chose the term upstream um, is because uh, we as participants in the worldwide watershed are all upstream from someone, um, which means our stories contribute to the lives of other people no matter um, no matter what, the water that um, leaves our houses and leaves our um, bodies goes back into the watershed and enters someone else's life downstream. Um, and so the implications of being upstream from someone, I think, carries a, an amount of um, responsibility that we all share. Um, and I really love that um, we live in each other's lives in that way. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other artists. I'm also looking forward to any questions that um, the audience might have later at the end of this discussion. But thank you again so much for having me and um, thank you for facilitating this wonderful conversation. <laughs> thank you, Anna, that was wonderful. Libby Reuter is up next to talk about her project, Watershed Cairns. Libby and photographer Joshua Roan have trekked to locations all along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. Libby temporarily assembles large found glass cairns at key spots in the watershed and Joshua then photographs them in place. We have eight photographs and two cairns from the upper Mississippi River watershed in the exhibition. And Libby, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so Water is so important to us in the heart of the heartland. Um, and coming from St. Louis, a little farther downstream from uh, Dubuque, it, it was the floods of 1993 that caused me to really pay attention to water. And in 2011, uh, Joshua Rowan and I started to mark the watershed. and we tend to think of the earth as flat, or at least the map as flat, but this was an illustration of how everything that rains on the central part of the United States flows down into the Gulf of Mexico. Hence, the name of our project is Watershed. Um, the second half of our name is Cairns. So Cairns are, uh, in as we use it, are glass sculptures that I build from household glass. If you look at this carefully, you'll see that I'm hoisting a, a bowl and it's on top of an upside down um, candlestick and other glass lamp parts and bowls make up the rest of the sculpture. So they're all common everyday parts of glass. And the term cairn is um, taken from uh, stacks of rocks that hikers will build uh, to mark a trail or maybe as a memorial to an event. I was here or um, at this point something happened that's significant in my life. But the form of the cairns um, started even earlier as I was paying attention to the Roman Catholic reliquaries that, that were objects of precious metal, sometimes jewels and glass or crystal that held the bones of saints. So you can see a sketch that I made of a slightly different shaped cairn, always paying attention, I mean, reliquary, paying attention to the way these unusual shapes joined each other. And that was the inspiration for the glass cairn sculptures. So Josh and I um, started to document the Mississippi River uh, from Lake Itasca. Some of you have probably been there. This is the place where the uh, Mississippi River is small enough to walk across it, um, north of Bemidji, Minnesota at Lake Itasca. 
So this exhibition shows the pieces that started uh, the Upper Mississippi, and then you can see um, this is the uh, culmination at the confluence of the two rivers, the Mississippi and the Missouri, looking southward. Um, so this cairn you're looking at is about 79 inches tall, and um, to give you an idea of the scale of the pieces. And we shot this at dawn. So this, um, as you're looking, um, the Missouri River is on the left side of this image, and the Mississippi River is on the right. Uh, that that doesn't feel right, <laughs> but we're looking south. Take it that that um, information. So we hope next to follow the Mississippi River down to the Gulf. Not unlike Anna, we want to uh, be able to visualize the entire river. So on our way down, we um, stopped in Iowa and took a number of shots. This one is um, called Lily Pads. This also is in the exhibition. And this was created at Bulger's Hollow Recreation Area near Clinton, Iowa. And with each one of these pieces, we, we want to draw attention to their place on the location on the river. So in the exhibition and on our website, um, it's the location is always identified, including with the GPS coordinates. And on more recent work, we also show the elevation so you can kind of keep track of the river as it flows down to the Gulf. Um, you can see the little black rectangle on this map that shows the location of the exact piece. And um, as we've it's important to stress that we do not leave the pieces there, that they are removed after we photograph them. So how we accomplish this is that Josh has a big van and um, we fill it with cairn parts, usually eh, 20 or 30 inches high that will be transported in a crate or a tub. And then when we get to the site, like this one at the Mines of Spain Recreation Area. Uh, Josh and I will look around for the space that says something about the condition of the watershed at that location. And in this case, it's a false channel or the remnant of an old channel of the Mississippi River that in, during some flooding thousands, maybe millions of years ago, the river changed its course and abandoned this channel that now is the Coulee, which is the name of this piece. And um, so I will assemble the piece and Josh sets up his camera and then he helps guide me um, because he can imagine and see the entire frame. So he'll tell me, can you move it a little closer to the edge? Can you move it to the left, to the right? Can you make it a little taller? Um, and so that's how we do that. And the next slide kind of shows you the location of this piece as it overlooks the Mississippi River. And you can see the two channels, the um, original and the um, now channel leading down to the Mississippi River. So these are the two works in the exhibition and kind of in their context with other shots which were taken um, between Lake Itasca and St. Louis. So we, by doing this, we hope to help people visualize the river and to their place on it that Maybe some of you have visited the mines of Spain and you might even know that exact place. Um, and so hopefully this helps you visualize how that trail um, is relates to the river and how our lives relate to the river. Um, 
another shot here showing the close-up of the cairn that was part of lily pads and you can see the lily pads image off to the left thank you libby that was great i like your maps so we can get a sense of the location because that's such an integral part yes thank you work well, next up we would have jennifer lynn bates but like i said she wasn't able to join us for the talk so I don't want her to be left out, so I'm going to briefly talk about her installation, Clean Water, that you see here. So Jennifer is an instructor of fine arts at Hawkeye Community College. She earned a Master of Fine Arts in Painting from Pratt Institute in 2002 and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Art and Design from Iowa State University in 1998. She is a practicing visual artist living and working in the Cedar Falls, Waterloo, Iowa area. So she's our artists from Iowa here. Clean Water began as an installation at the Waterloo Center for the Arts as a section of a river in Zimbabwe. When we invited her to participate in the exhibition, she and I discussed how the installation would evolve for Dubuque. After some discussion, we realized that it would be a natural progression if in the exhibition for her to focus on the community level. So she basically reinvented her original installation and reused all of those original recycled materials from the Waterloo installation and created what you see here, clean water. It's in the form of the section of the Mississippi River that runs from the greater Dubuque tri-state region or runs through the greater Dubuque tri-state region from north of Lock and Dam number 11 to south of Catfish Creek. So here actually is where the Lock and Dam is. And right across here in this white space, that's the Wisconsin side. So this part here is Eagle Point Park. And then going down river, go to the end, this is Catfish Creek right here. So this is the mouth of Catfish Creek. And then if you can see here, you can't see this one as well, but you can see this opening in the installation. That is where the bridges are that go across the river. So this one, you'll see this better in an upcoming slide, but this is the Illinois, the Julian Dubuque Bridge. And so this is East Dubuque. And this is the Wisconsin Bridge going into Wisconsin. So this is Chaplin Schmidt Island here. So I think it's just brilliant how she did this. So here you can see that clean water is made up of over 1,600 recycled water bottles colored in vibrant blues to muddy browns. And we know that there are actually 1,665 because our Collections and Exhibition Fellow counted all of them. <laughs> the various shades of blue represent clean water, and this water is safe for swimming, fishing, and wetland ecosystems. The remaining black, brown, and gray bottles represent unclean water that's unsuitable for recreation and wildlife. Here you can see the bridge there. That's a nicer shot there. Jennifer explores the effects of pollution and stewardship on the water quality of the Mississippi River. This connects to her current interest in clean water access and how the Mississippi River brings life to communities like Dubuque, but polluting it causes death or dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. That's what she's working on currently. Next up, we have Susan Knight to talk about her two installations in the exhibition, Archetypal Water and Hidden Magic. Susan's focus is on the science of water flow, that is hydrology and ecology. And Susan, I will now turn it over to you. Oh my goodness, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be to participate in this exhibition. And I echo everything that Anna said. Um and and uh I am very grateful for um Stacy, all of your work and, and everybody else's work in this. Um I was a realist figurative painter. Um, when in 2002, I was asked to participate in a show about rivers. 
it was a memorial show for a friend of mine who died. And so it was really important for me to be in that show. And I knew that I didn't want to paint a river. Uh, I didn't want to photograph a river, but I knew that I could cut um, a map of the river that I grew up on in Michigan, the Grand River, and that flows into Lake Michigan. And in the middle of, um, of uh, that project, which was, I, I thought, uh, a one-time only project, a slew of my own water memories came into my head and um, they grabbed me with such force that I had to, uh, I had to see that through. And um, so uh, uh, when you talked about personal experience, Stacy, um, it really, um, it really talked to me because my, my first, work with paper and work with an exacto knife was through um making visible my own water stories and my own narratives but those narratives soon gave way to investigating uh investigating the water uh i was around water uh my entire life on the great lakes and i knew you know, to look for the, the color of the water, um, uh, how the waves were, uh, you know, if it was choppy, if, it, if there was an undertow. Um, but I really didn't know about the science of water. And so um, I, I just, um, I felt like I, I uh, my involvement with water and with cutting, uh, was just a series of building blocks. And um, I, along the way, I began reading about uh, the hydrology of water and um, the, you know, the kind of movement that we all see uh, on the surface, but then there are archetypal movements that are um, on scene underneath the surface. Um, as well as some that you see and yet you think are scattered. Um, I'm thinking right now of the vortex that's created when water hits a bridge abutment um, or any kind of uh, a log or rock in the water. Um, and, and what you see is an archetypal movement that, that looks random and yet it is the vortex. Um, again and again and again, whenever water hits something solid. Now, there's another movement underneath the surface of the water that you have no clue about because you either have chop or no chop on the surface or you've got wave action. And yet, um, underneath the surface of the water, there is a fat triangle and egg shape that is repeated and repeated again and again in an ocean current, in every river in the world, and even in a pipe. And so what um, the, the slide that you have up now is my um, archetypal water piece um, that, that talks about that archetypal movement that um, is a fat triangle and egg shape that's repeated again and again. And um, where you see that in this piece is um, in the, the center, the center medallion that is cut out. Well, it looks like there might be lace in that center medallion, but it is um, a fat triangle and egg shape that's, that is repeated. Um, in different ways in each of these pieces. Now, my concept of doing this was um, to imagine that I was studying water, that I was looking down at the surface of the water and I was actually able to take a core sample of the water so I could look down to the bottom. And if I did that, 
course, this is all fantasy, but if and actually it's magic, magical realism, but if I could do that, um, what you would see is that that triangle and egg shape, which is the which is hydrology, the hydrology of water. Now, um, I, uh, you know, there's there's one way to convey what is on my mind, and that's very didactic. And if I did that, you wouldn't want to look at it. But um, I I wanted to make this um, allure this piece alluring to look at. I wanted to make it interesting. I wanted to pull in um, the viewer. And so um, what you're seeing is actually um, two pieces of um, of mylar, coated mylar, that are arranged back to back. And each piece of the mylar is um, first painted with, with uh, acrylic ink um, in a very stylized, abstract notion of, of water. And um, so here is a, a little bit of a, uh, of a detail of it. And you can see each um, each of these two pieces that are hung together is out from the um, from the wall a little bit, and you can see the shadow coming through. So in the background, you can see the second piece, and I I've, I've got to say now how grateful I am to um, to be in the show. Uh, to have these two pieces of mine not exactly talking to the other installations in the room, but um, I what what um, the grouping of all of these installations together allow me to do is to understand um, how my piece is behaving. It's kind of like having children. And, uh, and watching them among strangers, you know, watching them being introduced and interacting with strangers, well, they always surprise you. And relative to the pieces that are um, that are in the same gallery with my work, well, you know, um, it tells me a lot. And so um, uh, to get back to the piece in the background, um, millions of years ago there was water on the earth and and uh it the shapes were um the water was going everywhere because there were no plants to hold in the land to secure the land um and so it was only gradually can you imagine um can you imagine having uh you know, um, soil that was moving uh, as much as the water around you. It's hard to imagine now because um, the uh, the uh, the coasts, um, uh, what holds in the water is are are the um, are the plants, and so um, what. Um, what you see in this piece is um, components cut um, and they're actually the roots of the plants that are holding the soil. And uh, this was conceived to talk about uh, groundwater because, um, and groundwater is another on-seen water, um, but if conceived to talk about um, how the plants actually, uh, or the roots of the plants actually act as super highways to direct um, the rain, the precipitation um, uh, from above the surface. And uh, they direct it in order to recharge the groundwater. Um, but, uh, you know, in the sense that, um, the the plants and the plant roots are actually holding together the soil which holds together um uh the uh, uh the coast of of the 
river or the lake. Um, that interested me. And um, this is uh, uh, bo uh, this piece is not mylar, it's paper um, that has Tyvek uh, attached to it. Um, and I'm using um, a Tyvek as a DuPont product. And uh, it's, uh, it's a non woven uh, uh, fiber. And um, uh, anyway, it, when you see this for real, you can see that the Tyvek I've used is reflective Tyvek. And I'm thinking about um, the reflection. Of, when I'm using reflective Tyvek, I'm thinking about the sun um, reflecting on water. Um, um, so um, this piece is, um, you know, it, it's uh, based on the roots of native plants in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was great. All right. We have a quick poll for you all. Yeah, have you seen the exhibition in person? Considering that we had to close the museum mid-March, but we did open mid-January. Some of you actually did get to see the exhibition, but some of you didn't. So we were just wondering of our attendees here tonight, if you could answer yes or no, if you were actually able to see the exhibition in person. At this present time, it's 62% uh, have said yes. Okay. And 38% said they did not see it. So we've got 76 people, or 76% of attendees have taken the poll. Uh, Great. All right, so I'm gonna start, we have about, about 10 minutes left for some questions. And we've gotten a few in ahead of time, and I think we might, we may have one here, but I had a question for all of you, just considering our time, would any of you, like to share how the current pandemic has affected your work, if it has at all? Well, I will I will share that we ha haven't been able to go out um, um, shooting because of the um, stay at home orders. So hopefully they will be gone and we'll be able to go finish our trip from either plan is a a is to finish to the Gulf and B is to um, do new work on the Ohio since it contributes so much water to the watershed. Yeah, I can I can answer that question. Um, I am not sure when the next opportunity will come up for me to share tea. <laughs> with participants um, in an intimate setting. <laughs> um, so this project is really on hold. Um, I, I have um, several kind of in progress opportunities that we've um, pushed off to 2021 now, um, a couple of them. And um, so the answer is a big fat yes. <laughs> it has most certainly affected my practice. <laughs> Anna, you're going to have to be doing virtual tea conversations eventually. It, it, you know, it's occurred to me, I think there might be a place for it. I haven't quite figured out what that is yet. <laughs> that could be a very comforting, comforting thing to do. I think it might. I mean, I, I, so yeah, I've been thinking about are there ways that I can um, circulate cups in a safe way from person to person by having like setting, getting a little, um, you know, kind of uh, kit set up and passing it around or having them send through the mail. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> we will, we, I'm, I'm working on it. So, yeah. yeah. Susan, um, I haven't been as um, I haven't been affected directly as Libby and Anna by uh, the COVID. Uh, I'm I'm able to work in my studio and and just continue cutting. Oh, that's great. I've, I've heard that from a lot of artists. That things haven't really changed. I'm still isolated in my studio. <laughs> Um, I would like to contribute. Uh, we do have a really nice comment uh, from Bob Felderman. He says, thanks for doing this virtual tour and sharing the information. 
Yeah, and I think we can echo that from a lot of us. Uh, we're just so tickled to have each of you join us today. Okay. All right, let's go to another question. And I'll just throw this out there and whoever wants to answer it. There's a couple more questions here. Were there artists who were influential to your work? Well, I'll answer that. Um, okay. Yes, and a number of them. Um, Mary Miss, uh, who some of you may know, she's a contemporary installation artist, but she's done a lot of work about rivers. And um, one of the pieces that struck me was she went back to a town where there had been a lot of flooding 10 years prior and the whole downtown had been flooded and she learned where the water had risen in that flood and she marked trees and buildings with uh, blue discs because she reasoned that a lot of the people who were children at the time of that flood had no sense about how the water had reached above the doorways in uh, in downtown and so this was her way of creating a, a large interactive piece that helped people be aware of um, what flood a flood had done to their community. I guess um, in that I work with um, structures and systems, um, I'm I get energy. Um, and I get inspiration from any artists that um, that work with that. And then um, the artists who uh, assemble really um, um, intense uh, groupings of things. I do a lot of layering, uh, a lot of components and a lot of component. Uh, I draw components and then I draw again with, when I layer those components. And so that usually um, produces uh, some intense layering. And um, you, you didn't see that in the ar archetypal water piece that's cut mylar, but my other pieces are. And so any artist that um, that is working in that manner just really inspires me. Yeah, and I can just really quickly say too, um, I, lots of artists inspire me, but um, one of the things that I think um, really uh, fuels my practice is um, the history of um, the ceramic medium um, and it's uh, in the way that it's always um, kind of bridged the gap between <clears throat> object uh, and of course daily life and um, and so the intimacy that we experience when we use those objects um, is something that I really lean on pretty heavily when I construct these social moments um, uh, and you know it's something that human beings have been doing for many thousands of years so I've, I have lots of sort of historical um, influences uh, that you might also be able to detect, particularly the blue and white um, is something that um, is really clearly uh, kind of coming through. And there's a really wonderful, I won't get into the whole story, but there's a wonderful history to that and why I use it. So <laughs> to be continued. Huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We have a question from Julie. She makes a comment. I really like the different points of view on waterways. Has exhibiting together influenced your point of view or helped you rethink parts of your work? Well, I can um, address that. Um, just hearing Libby and Anna um, talk about their work today um, is, is so exciting. Um, you know, the pieces that you have uh, of mine are, are very broad. They're abstract, so they can be abstract about a lot of a lot of things. And so I really appreciate how closely um, your work relates to um, the land and the river, specific areas, the confluence of the of the Missouri. And of course, Omaha is on the Missouri. So the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi. And, and to know that I'm looking south at it and you're Karen, um, it was just fantastic. And Anna, it, the same with you. And I, um, I'm, thank you. <laughs> thank you. 
Well, and I will say that um, hearing Anna's talk today, I'm I'm always challenged by how we can engage people in our work and have it be more meaningful and connected to them and that in my objective would be that they in turn become more connected to the river but um how to get people to participate has been um, it, you didn't give me an answer for how i could do it but it's an inspiration that i want to work on that more oh that's really wonderful <laughs> thank you yeah i i kept on um thinking as we were seeing all of the different components, the sort of micro to macro scope of the river um, and how um, there are, I mean, I think Libby, you and I are exploring um, kind of place and story along the river in, in an, in, in it, and really thinking about them as they manifest in these certain um, like parts of the river. Um, and I think that that's true too for everyone, but, but I definitely think um, the sort of zooming in and zooming out, um, Susan, your sort of microscopic look um, is really inspiring to me for so many reasons, um, but mostly because I think when we get like intimacy is really important to me, but that's a different kind of intimacy that you're exploring. Um, and I'm, I, yeah, I'm really excited by thinking about how prompts or even conversations can get other participants in my, um, in my project to think about those, uh, like the microscopic moments in their lives. Um, and also just Libby, all the um, sort of the way in which people, um, place themselves and create memories in these certain and and they're the and and they're described so clearly in these stories um it reminds me actually of these really picturesque um uh, shots of the cairns along the river. Um, it's almost like they're captured in time as are these stories that are captured in time. So yeah. That's great. That's great. I'm, I'm... I'm glad to, it's great to make connections like this. We love showing your work all together. It just came together so perfectly, but it's great when you can make connections too. I have one more question, and this is for Libby. It's about the Cairns. It's from Jean. She she had a comment too. She said, all of your works of art have been enjoyable to see in person, and your talk this evening has given them more depth. And Libby, she wanted to know, have you built and left any Cairns to mark your presence there? No, we we do not leave them because um, they're they're very like the environment they're in. They're very fragile and wouldn't want them to uh, break and and litter the the ground. They're um, while they're while we're stacking them. In some cases, the, if a wind comes up, um, they they can go. Um, we've we've had that happen. Um, so they're they're too fragile to leave. We have hope would like to do some permanent pieces, but it it would have to be made specially, not assembled from household glass. For sure, <laughs> right? They're very fragile. Um, one last comment from Jerry. Thank you so much for making this exhibition so accessible. Hearing the artists share their experiences provided so much. And that's great, nice comment. But it is time to wrap up. And this has been really wonderful. I wanna thank Susan and Libby and Anna for braving this new virtual frontier with <laughs> us. Um, also, I wanna once again thank our exhibition sponsors, Midwest One and Sustainable Dubuque. Um, thank you again to Kay Schrader for assisting with this webinar in the background. And of course, I would like to thank each of our attendees for spending your time with us. Please continue to follow the museum on social media and through our weekly e-news to keep up with all of our future programming that you can participate in. And until next time, we are going to sign off for now. Thank you. <laughs>